If you're a beginner drummer, I wanna save you some serious time and frustration over the next few months or even years. Without learning these five critical skills, at some point you'll never become or even sound like the polished pro player you totally can be. But with these skills, you'll sound awesome sitting in with a band, you'll be feeling confident as you flow around the kit with ease, and you'll always know what to play as you improvise musically and create on your instrument. These are must-have beginner skills, and the truth is you can learn them. You can get started with these right now. You can do this. Hey, welcome to The Non-Glamorous Drummer. I'm so glad you're hanging out with me today. My goal is to help you become the musician other people want to jam with and have in their band. And we do this by teaching you the non-glamorous core skills that get you results faster and get you playing songs, nailing songs, and sounding awesome. And hey, while you're here, and especially if you're a beginner, I have a free gift for you in the description. It's my 25 Practical Rock Grooves and Fills PDF e-guide. So my guess is that as you're getting started, I know this is the way I felt as a total beginner, and so many people feel this way. It's that frustration of, I wanna play songs, but I don't know what to play in order to play songs. I don't know any grooves yet, I don't know kick patterns, I don't know any fills. And so it's kind of frustrating trying to learn your favorite songs, but it's like you don't have any vocabulary yet. Well, I wanna solve that for you. This guide gives you these basic building blocks. It's literally like the fundamental building blocks of rock drumming vocabulary. And so you can learn these 25 grooves, 25 fills, and just take these and start copying and pasting and applying to probably 99% of your favorite rock or pop songs. And you'll find you're able to just get up and running playing songs. And that is tremendously satisfying and fulfilling and a lot of fun. And so I hope that this helps you hack that whole process. And so if you're a beginner and you're just struggling with knowing what to play so you can nail songs, this is the guide for you. 25 practical rock grooves and fills. Go grab the e-guide, totally free. All right, on with today's lesson. So another big beginner problem, we kind of just highlighted one of those when it comes to playing songs. Kind of along those lines, as a beginner, you don't know what to practice or what to focus on. And that's, all, that's always the big struggle. And then years later, you know, hindsight's 2020, and you can look back. And so I can look back now and see, okay, that's what I wish that my beginner self could have known. And so you're gonna find that happens with you too. And maybe right now you're in that spot where you're a beginner and you're feeling overwhelmed. You're afraid of wasting time and not getting the results you want. Maybe, maybe you've passed the honeymoon phase of learning the drums where you got started a few months ago and now you're like, well, now I realize everything I don't know and I see all of the information out there of all the stuff I could learn and it's just overwhelming. Where do I start? Where do I focus? There's no clarity. It's just this wishy-washy mess of overwhelm. And so you feel stuck and then you might give up. And unfortunately, I've heard that from too many people where they get started, they give up, and then eventually they, maybe they get back into it. I don't want that to be you. I want you to have focus, clarity, and direction. And that is my goal today. Another camp here, another group of, of folks might be where you've reached a certain level, but you've plateaued. You know, maybe you've learned a bunch of stuff and you're like, okay, I'm feeling good about this, but you get stuck in a rut and you just don't know how to get out of it. And you're kind of losing inspiration, losing motivation, and you're just not sure do I really want to master the drums? I don't know. I just don't know what to do next. That's a lot of people too. And that was me. That's where I was around the time I was starting college. I started really playing the drums in high school. I was playing at my church and I grew fast. If we were to put this on a graph, like it was, you know, steep curve growing like crazy as a high school kid with hours a day to practice. It was awesome. Sometimes I miss those times. Not really, but <laughs> I miss having all the hours to practice, which was great. But then I got to this place kind of as I was getting into college where I started to realize everything I didn't know. I started to, you know, watch Jojo Mayer play and Steve Gadd play and some of these just Dave Weckl, some of these crazy, crazy people watching them play and realizing, wow, I can't do any of that. And yet I call myself a drummer. So I kind of felt stuck, like I had plateaued. Okay, I've learned the basics. What do I do next? Do I need to learn the chop stuff? Do I need to get really good at fusion and jazz and Latin? That was where I started to push myself. I kind of started to get into that, but that was still frustrating because I felt like I was losing my focus, losing my direction because I didn't want to really learn jazz, Latin fusion. I mean, I wanted to learn some jazz, but I just wasn't into the whole crazy fusion chops thing. I didn't really want to be Dave Weckl. I didn't really want to be Steve Gadd. I just, I wanted to play songs. And so that's where I was really getting frustrated and really plateauing, but thankfully, Thankfully, I had the opportunity to be introduced to another drummer in town who was who sort of mentored me for a short time. And during that time, I was also playing a bunch of gigs. And there were a couple other people that I really started learning a lot from and other musicians who really 
spoke a lot of encouragement and direction into me, and I'm so thankful for that because what I began to realize at that point was that I'm neglecting certain core skills that I need to revisit that will help me level up from this intermediate, eh, kind of amateurish sound to professional, polished pro. That's what these five skills helped me do. Revisiting these helped me really level up to that place where, all right, now I can really do this. Now I can really master the drums, and I hope it'll do the same for you. If you learn these five skills as a beginner drummer, you will be light years ahead of so many other players. I promise you. Um, everything else that follows, like all the other skills you practice, will become easier after this, and everything else you play will be more musical, intentional, you'll be able to improvise better. This just completes the picture. You'll have such a better picture of where you need to go drumming wise and everything will be making sense and falling into place. So, okay, without further ado, I want you to learn and aim to master these five skills. Hindsight is 2020. I'm looking back. I wish I could have taught my beginner self these things. Sometimes experience just has to teach you, but I hope that I can hack this process and save you a lot of time. So here we go. Number one, skill number one, playing simply. Great feeling time should be your number one goal. So high school Steven was like, I don't wanna play a simple beat, that's boring, that's lame, let's add some extra notes, you know? If the beat needs to be this. High school Steven was like. Except it didn't sound half that good and it was just a mess because I was so bored playing simply that I, I literally couldn't do it. Maybe that's you, I've heard that from students before, like, I don't wanna play a super simple beat, that's boring. Billie Jean by Michael Jackson, that song's boring. Vultures by John Mayer, that's boring. Love and Happiness, Al Green, that's boring. Here's the deal, if you are bored playing songs like that, that are simple, that means you are probably failing to master the art and skill of playing simply. Hey, I'm preaching to myself here, because that's where I was. See, I, I remember this, I, I look back, I remember, being so bored trying to play something simply. But here's the deal, and this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting concept that I've, I've heard from a lot of different people, and I think uh, Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs, I think he actually said this too. Um, really, I should look this up to verify it, but Mike Rowe and some others like him have talked about how sometimes you gotta be careful with following your passion. Um, sometimes following your passion is good as long as it's something you're good at that you can, that you can master. But he talks about how really passion follows mastery. And there's evidence time and time again in so many case studies of people in different lines of work where they master a skill and then they become passionate about it. Mike Rowe is always you know, interviewing you know, welders, plumbers, like people who work with their hands who went to trade school and they, they learn this stuff. And you know, as a kid, they weren't super passionate about you know, doing plumbing maybe. But once they mastered that skill, they became passionate about plumbing because they mastered it. Passion often follows mastery. And that's so true here with playing simply. Um, maybe this is the first time you've heard plumbing compared to drumming. Passion follows mastery, where if we can play a simple beat really well, and you can take pride and satisfaction in sitting here and playing. And play that all day and think about the sounds. How is this feeling? How is this sounding? If you can do that, you will become passionate about playing simply. And that is a huge deal. That was the big turning point that had to happen for me. I had to be okay with playing simply and I had to master playing simply. And it's amazing how much that leveled up my playing. It will level up yours too. So regularly practice the money beat. Practice the money beat, simple groove. Sit here and challenge yourself to play something super simple for a long period of time without adding any notes. Uh, something like this, really sparse maybe. Just super simple sparse groove. Challenge yourself to do that for like five minutes without stopping. Become okay with it, master it. You'll thank yourself later. Okay, skill number two, the dynamics pyramid. So great feel starts with appropriate dynamics within the kit. So I'll explain this a little bit. In a nutshell, what we wanna do is hit the drums, tap the cymbals. So early on in my playing, I remember getting to this place where uh, I remember being at a church rehearsal. We finished a rehearsal one, uh, one, it was like Thursday or something during the week at church. And I remember the sound guy coming up to me afterwards and he was like, Steven, you've been listening to metal or something? You're just bashing the cymbals. I'm having to like crank up the drum mics because I can't hear the drums well enough and all I'm picking up is cymbal in the overheads. And unfortunately it really did not dawn on me at that time, I wish it had, 
that the big biggest problem in my playing at that moment was that my drums were not loud enough, my cymbals were too loud. And in my defense, some of that was coming from I was working on jazz a lot, and in jazz, it's the other way around. Your groove, your timekeeping, the drive of jazz, it's coming from the cymbals. You know, it's all about cymbals, but in rock, it's all about drums. And the cymbals are more of an accompaniment to the drums. So speaking in rock drumming terms, we want to be loudest, lowest on the kit. So your kick, you know, it's the bottom of the pyramid. Loud down here, loud down low. And then toms and snare uh, can be pretty loud too. Maybe not quite as strong as the kick needs to be because the kick can get lost if you're not really emphasizing it and trying to be really strong on it. So be strong on the kick when you're playing rock. If you're playing at a high volume, the kick really needs to be loud, otherwise it gets lost. So that you're hitting the drums and then up here at the top of the kit, the cymbals, that's, you know, that's the tiny tip of the pyramid, that needs to be soft. And so a good balance might be something like this. tapping the cymbals, hitting the drums. Now, if I were to bring my cymbal volume up, so I'm full on hitting cymbals, well, that means I've got to bring my drumming volume up even more and play rim shots on the snare, really hit the drums hard. So it's all about ratio. It's not about do this level and this level, it's all about ratio. If you're gonna go loud on your cymbals, you gotta go louder on your drums. But if you're playing very softly on your drums, just say, stay soft on the cymbals. Super soft on the cymbals if you're not gonna go hard on the drums. Do that and your groove will finally feel right. There will be a foundation and it will feel balanced and it will feel professional. That was a huge deal, a huge turning point for me. All right, skill number three, artificial rebound. Creating motion with your sticks is the secret to fluidity, flow, I'm reading this so I can get this nice and eloquently correct here. It's the secret to fluidity, flow, and naturally smoother timekeeping around the kit. Because without smooth motion in your playing, everything kind of becomes stiff like this. And it's like falling down the stairs, tumble, tumble over here. If you have motion with your strokes, so that means you formed your fulcrum point, you can toss the stick up and down. We've got other lessons about this. I'll link some in the description so you can check this out. If you establish up and down motion with everything you do, that means the sticks are always like the slow motion kid jumping on a trampoline. Therefore, you're able to arc from drum to drum and go here to here. You're always able to hit something with the intent of going to the next thing. You're always hitting and immediately rebounding to the next thing, which is a manual lift because the stick doesn't naturally do that from the floor tom. If you hit the floor tom, and you just let it bounce, that's what it does, right? It just, that's it. But when you're practicing this motion, this up and down motion that literally you can practice by air drumming, then, then you can practice lifting the stick up and down and therefore playing something like this. That is the fundamental first step to fluid flow around the kit and what happens when you've got smooth flow around a kit? Speed. Speed always starts with smoothness. Without the smoothness, you can't have the speed because then the speed just turns into a giant mess pile. But if you've got that smoothness, that open, smooth stroke, that motion, then from there you can scale in volume and in tempo. And that's pretty awesome. So that's a big deal. I wish that I had understood that much sooner. So practice striking surfaces with the intent of moving to the next, always having that smooth up and down, even when you're not hitting hard. We're not only doing this when hitting loudly, we're floating around, you know. See how softly you can play while still using that stick height, literally just dropping the stick on the drums. Practice that. Check out some of the additional lessons on the, the detailed mechanics of what we're doing in our hand to do this if you're new to this. That'll definitely help you out. But this will be tremendous. It all comes back to really what, when I remember learning this in college was when I was practicing marimba. And on marimba, it's all about, you know, you've got a marimba is like an oversized xylophone, for those of you who don't know. It's like a massive xylophone. And down low, you've got these rosewood bars that are super big and wide. 
And so when you're moving from note to note with mallets, um, here's some marimba mallets. When you're, you're hitting the marimba with these mallets, you always have to be thinking of where you're going next. You're always moving in these arc motions on the marimba. And furthermore, when you hit one of the rosewood bars, you don't want to go like that, because otherwise you choke it out. If the, if the yarn mallet stays on the wood, it chokes out the resonance. Instead, you want to hit it like that. It's just like this, this snapping kind of motion. It's just like touching a hot stove. You know, you want to quickly touch it and be done if you want to touch a hot stove without burning yourself. <laughs> and so it's the same way with marimba where you want to quickly lift the mallet up. And so that whole mindset, that whole marimba approach really taught me a lot about navigating around the drum set. And that was something I really started to utilize on the kit and um, something I, I wish I could have learned before ever learning marimba in college. So I hope this approach helps you out too. So along these lines of artificial rebound, Skill number four, bouncing the beater. So we're talking about bass drum here and achieving that same fluidity we did with our sticks on the bass drum. So if establishing a motion with the sticks allows us smoothness and therefore speed, safe to, say, safe to assume the same is true down here on the bass drum. If we can establish a motion just like this, moving the beater back and forth, we're not even touching the head. Again, it's just that air playing. If we can air play right here with our foot, that starts with having your pedal adjusted for enough beater angle to begin with. If at rest your pedal is there, that's no good. Adjust it to be at least 45 degrees. You can go a little further if you want to. And then make sure that your foot's not too far up. If you're playing heel up, that's great. Be down here. Give yourself some space on the foot pedal. Heel down, same thing. Make sure you're not choking up here. That way you can establish this motion and just get the beater bobbing just like this, which means you can use the same motion to play quietly and loudly. That was pretty soft. I mean, that was very soft, just tapping the head, just like the hot stove thing. Now we'll gradually get louder. That same motion allows you to play super soft and louder and gives you fluidity and smoothness. That is critical here. Motion equals smoothness and fluidity, which equals speed and volume. Does that make sense? That's, that's a huge takeaway here between skills three and four, artificial rebound with the sticks and bouncing the beater. So you could call it artificial rebound on the beater. We're just establishing motion. Same thing. This is so key. I'll, I'll say it again. I'm going to repeat it again. Just like a, a good pastor preaching a sermon. We got to drive this thing. We got to drive this point home that motion, when we establish motion, that gives us fluidity and smoothness. When we have fluidity and smoothness, we can then eventually go as loud and fast as we want without running into roadblocks. If you're running into speed and volume roadblocks, take a step back and examine, okay, do I have fluidity and smoothness with what I'm playing? The answer is no. Okay, do I have a smooth motion? So you can work backwards like that troubleshooting. I hope that makes sense. This is critical and I wish I had learned this sooner as a total beginner. Um, this whole bouncing the beater thing, I actually remember listening to an interview on a podcast with Dave Elich. He's a drummer, I think in LA, and he's kind of seen as like the, the teacher of the professional session drummers. Um, this was years ago, but I remember Dave Elich talking about this and the importance of, you know, posture, being relaxed, giving your, your leg enough space here and bouncing the beater. He was a big proponent for bouncing the beater and not burying, because when you bury, you eliminate the motion. How are you going to play fast and smooth if you're burying? Also, how are you going to play softly if you're varying? And your knee's going to hurt, your foot's going to hurt, everything's tight and cramped up. You're not going to bury your sticks in the drum, so why would you bury your bass drum beater? Establish motion, that's what it all comes back to. And so as far as a specific action there, literally just sit there, practice bobbing the beater like this. And then practice just barely kissing the head. So soft you can sit here and have a conversation over it. And then gradually get louder, practice controlling that volume. You'll get a great foot workout in the process too. And by the way, this works heel down, also works heel up. Just make sure you're giving yourself room and your foot's not too far up the foot plate. Okay, uh, last but probably greatest. <laughs> probably saved the best one for last year. Skill number five, interacting with the melody. Man, I wish I had known this sooner. I think this was something that I finally really came full circle on and understood after college. So we're talking like when I was like 22 or so, and I had played a whole bunch of gigs and was really becoming a full-time gigging drummer. Finally, this was all hitting me and it had been marinating for a while, finally came to fruition. Wish I'd learned this sooner. So here's the deal. 
the best drum parts stem from the melody of the song. Most of the time, kick pattern is coming from melody uh, and also chord changes. Chord changes are coming from melody and a lot of times the kick drum pattern is reinforcing the chord changes. Fills are based on melody. Uh, you know, maybe the singer stops singing and then a fill happens or maybe a fill happens while the singer is singing and that fill reinforces the rhythm that the singer is singing. Either way, all of the drum parts are going to stem from the vocal melody or maybe the guitar part, whatever the prominent melodic figure is in the song, whatever the main driving force is in the song, which most of the time is gonna be the vocal or the riff, whatever the, the guitar riff might be. And so when you understand that, and when you listen to those things as you're playing, you naturally start playing things that fit. If you're listening to the melody and you're seeking to match the melody and play things that fit with the melody, then nothing you play will sound wrong. And that was a huge thing when I, when I stumbled upon that. I remember listening to an interview with Aaron Sterling. This was from 2013. Aaron Sterling's an LA session drummer. He's my favorite drummer. I've uh, spent a lot of time listening to his interviews and digging into his material. Um, I love everything he does, everything he plays on. And he was talking about the importance of melody because the guy interviewing him asked him, so, uh, you know, in your in-ear mix, what are you listening to while you're playing? The bass? Because the assumption is always that, well, drummers are supposed to listen to the bass. Well, the, the bass is great, and the bass player and the drummer always need to be tight and, and interacting with each other and glued together. But it's more important for the bass player to listen to the drummer than the drummer to listen to the bass player because the drummer actually needs to be paying the most attention to the vocal. And that was Aaron's point here. He was like, you know, I can deal with a bad bass player on a session or on a gig, but a bad vocalist... That's rough because I want a good vocalist who I can count on, who is singing in time and who I can interact with and lock with because everything comes from melody. I'm a big Aaron Sterling fan. I actually went to a uh, master class that he did in Nashville a few years ago. And so I had the chance to ask him that because he had talked about that a lot. And so I asked him, so would you say that melody is the most important element of any song in forming the drum parts? Like, is, is that what tells you what to play? And he was like, Absolutely, 100%. That was his answer. I was like, yes, I love this because it was just, it was so much validation for what I had been gradually learning from him and gradually figuring out on gigs. Melody is 100% the thing you need to pay attention to. And that's what I failed to do so early on. And it just, I had to reach this level of maturity to eventually do that. And it requires, you know, you've got to master your technical skills. Everything else we've talked about here, you've got to master those things so that you're not having to think about those things so that instead you can think about melody. That's critical. When you can do that and you can think about melody, you can start playing to the melody and you can start listening to the song and what's going on around you while you play. And so listen a bunch to your favorite music and always ask yourself, why is the drummer playing that part? And so, you know, analyze what, what's the drummer doing? Is it matching with the melody? Is it matching with that guitar part? And the guitar part's always going to be matching with the vocal. It all fits together. Eventually you start to understand this puzzle, how it's all these puzzle pieces fitting together. And then practice doing that yourself. And if you're gigging, even better. When you're jamming, even if you're just jamming with friends, practice listening to what they're doing and thinking, what can I play that fits that, that matches that? But seriously, just listen to music. That was, that was the, the biggest first step for me, just sitting and listening to music and paying attention to these things. And it was like all these light bulb moments going off, fireworks in my head. It's like on Ratatouille where the, the rat's like tasting stuff and he's just experiencing all the fireworks of the flavor. That was what I started noticing when I hit this point in my playing where I realized it was like this epiphany. Ah, oh, melody, that's it. All the drum parts come from melody. So I went and listened to all, the, all my favorite songs and all this music. I was like, yes, there's an example of it. Yes, there's another example of it. Melody is what it all comes back to 100%, just like Aaron Sterling said. I feel like I finally get this. And that was such a huge turning point. I just wish I could have come to that sooner. So I hope that for you. I hope that you're able to land on this sooner and you're able to experience these kinds of epiphanies before they even have to feel like epiphanies. That's my goal. So hey, what's gonna happen in your playing if you learn these five things, if you learn these five skills? Well, everything you play will sound musical. Everything will sound musical and it will fit. Everything will feel easier. Because remember, you got that motion down, everything is smooth and natural, everything will feel easier. Learning songs will be more fun because you've gotten some technical stuff out of the way and you're, you now know how to listen. You'll be able to sit in with a band and sound awesome jamming right off the bat. That's pretty awesome. And uh, something that's also gonna help you with this is that e-guide I told you about earlier. Grab the 25 Grooves and Fills e-guide, begin practicing those because that's gonna help give you that basic vocabulary to get started. And it's gonna help, help you build some coordination too. 
and you can practice this whole motion thing and kick drum beater bouncing thing along with that. And so this lesson and everything I've thrown at you here combined with some of the additional lessons I'm linking as well as that e-guide, this is all gonna work to give you this nice, well-rounded, focused direction in your playing. I hope that this gets you out of ruts. I hope this gets you off the plateau. I hope this, hope this eliminates overwhelm and shows you, all right, here's where I can focus. These five skills, let me focus on these and I promise you, you will grow tremendously. It's the whole 80-20 thing. Like this is the 20% that's gonna give you the 80% of results. I promise you, test it out for yourself. It worked for me, it's worked for my students. So have a lot of fun, go in practice. And before you go, question for you, which of these five skills do you think is slash will be most critical for your drumming? Which one of these was like the biggest, ah, okay, I get it now, moment for you. Which, which, which of these was the biggest and potentially the most helpful for you? What do you think will be most critical for your drumming? Let me know in the comments. All right, thanks for watching as always. Thanks for hanging out today. I hope this has been a super helpful, valuable lesson video for you. As always, stay non-glamorous. Know that you can do this. I'll see you on the next video.